Marhaban wa ahlan bukum fi barnamij dakhil Washington. Ana mudifakum, Robert Satloff. Fi America, tabdu al amalia el tashri iya el mutamathala fi san el kawanin wa ikna akhlabia a da majlisa el shuyuh wa nawab bidamwa. Tabdu hadihil amalia basha wa faudawiya. Wa la talik. بأقدام ديمقراطية في العالم. شهدنا مؤخرا مثالا حيا عندما أكر الكونغرس كنونا مثيرا للجدل لتأمين الدعم العسكري لثلاث دول حليفة أوكرانيا وإسرائيل وتايوان وكان من المفروض أن يتم إقرار القانون بسهولة ويسر ولكن العملية التشريعية جاءت أكس ذلك تماما وكانت شاكة ومؤكدة لحصل الحظ نجح التسويت لبحث دهاليز السياسة المتألكة بالتسويت لتأمين الدعم العسكري لثلاثة من أقرب خلفائنا إلينا يسرني نستديف نخبة من الخبراء السياسيين Jessica Taylor, Asher Hildebrand, one mini racker. Welcome back to Dachel, Washington. The metaphor that is often used is making sausage. It's not pretty. It's fairly ugly. But that's how legislation often gets done in the American political system. Today, we're going to take a close look at the politics and policymaking of foreign aid one of the most misunderstood items on the American political agenda, but one of the most controversial and high-value political issues we have today. I'm delighted to welcome Jessica Taylor, Mini Racker, and for his first time on our show, Asher Hildebrand. Welcome to you all. All right, Asher, let me start with you. If you ask most Americans what percent of our federal budget they think is committed to giving money to countries abroad, foreign aid. What do you think most Americans would say? Uh, far higher percentage than the actual amount. Uh, they might say 5%, 10%, even 25% when it's uh, less than 1%. Exactly, less than 1%. But yet, Jessica, as we know, this is a hot button political issue. Um, so that's the context Let's look at what just happened when Joe Biden tried to get an aid package approved to support three of America's closest allies, Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan. Um, first of all, this is not the first time any of them have gotten money. This is a, a fairly regular occurrence. Is that right? It is, especially when we've seen what's happened with the war in Ukraine and then with what's happening in the Middle East. Um, Israel especially has been a long one of our most stringent U.S. allies and things. But of course, there's a lot of different politics that goes into this. Um, I think the first of all is that, you know, Ukraine aid would be something that I think would have been non-controversial in previous years. But we have a Republican Party that is now driven by Donald Trump, who has um, a strong sense of isolationism when it comes to foreign policy and also, of course, has a very cozy relationship with Russian President Vladimir Putin. So you see a lot of that isolationist bent coming out in the Republican caucus that really runs counter to, you know, the Reagan, um, Reagan-esque, you know, strong foreign policy of the Cold War and understanding that these are geopolitical calculations and that, um, you know, one helping one country helps stabilize all of, you know, Europe, really. Um, I've traveled to, you know, Germany and, um, uh, Brussels, and I'm frequently asked about this, you know, because Europeans have, I think, a very hard time understanding why we don't care about this more. And again, I think it's a lot of that has to do with the Trump strain of the Republicanism uh, in the party, but also simply that I, I also think a lot of American voters are sort of burned by what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan. And there's just such a hesitancy to commit troops, which we're not even talking about here, but they, I think, feel like they're going to be going down, you know, uh, a slippery slope in a way of um, uh, uh, of if, they, if we commit this amount of aid that maybe we would eventually see troops there and things. I think there's, you know, again, there's just some feelings there left over from the early 2000s and, it, and 2010s. So, 
actually, let, let's take a deeper look at this before we move to the two other potential recipients of this these aids. Uh, uh, many the when was it that the party of strong national defense and the promotion of democracy abroad turned on those principles? Was it just Donald Trump, or is it something deeper and broader? Do you think is there? Is there um, uh, uh, a sense out in the heartland that Ukraine doesn't matter, that Russia doesn't matter? What's going on out there? I think, um, you know, I think Donald Trump was really playing on a feeling that already exists, already existed among the electorate and seems to have just been getting stronger um, from the people I've been talking to, regular voters you know, people are struggling enough. And I think they get to a point where they're like, why are we helping other people in other countries before we're helping our own people? Um, I think voters are really fired up about, you know, economic struggles here at home. They're fired up about the border. Voters on the Republican side, I would say. Um, and, And so there's a real sense of like, who are these elites in Washington who are giving the money that should be used to, to fix our problems to other countries instead? And so I think, um, you know, Donald Trump has really been, um, you know, playing on that fear for a long time. I think that's why he was so successful in 2016. He kind of has a good read of people's strongest emotions and the things they're most aggrieved by. Um, And I think that's just continued since he was first elected. And it seems to have gotten stronger and stronger, you know, with um, Ukraine, you know, after um, voters started to see this kind of drag on, not sure, you know, the effects that our aid is having. I think you see voters really angry about it. So, um, uh, Asher, if if the Republicans have um, moved away from their traditional view on um, uh, leading the global fight for democracy and and uh, strong on, on uh, projecting national defense. Um, let's take a moment to look at the politics of Israel, because that's changed in, in, uh, in a reverse manner, in a certain sense. Um, the party that received almost 80 percent of the Jewish vote is now the party that is dri- that is divided on uh, on aid to Israel. How is that turning out? Well, it's certainly true uh, at face value, but I think they're much different contexts politically as well as historically, right? In Ukraine, we have uh, a U.S. ally uh, that is besieged by a military invasion from a much larger aggressor uh, that uh, uh, is uh, very inconsistent with the values that have guided U.S. foreign policy since the Second World War. And there is growing debate within the Republican Party about uh, adherence to those values. Uh, There is growing, uh, as Jessica said, uh, growing sympathy toward Putin uh, among some corners of the Republican Party. Um, But by and large, it's rising to the defense of our ally. In the case of Israel and uh, its campaign against Hamas, Israel is our ally, our longstanding ally. And the concern is that Uh, Our ally is using uh, the very generous assistance that the U.S. has historically provided and that has enjoyed very strong bipartisan support in ways that are uh, exacerbating the humanitarian conflict and uh, crisis in Gaza, causing much human suffering and potentially violating international norms. Right. Uh, And so uh, so you have a debate within the Democratic Party, I'd say the, the overall vote. On aid, uh, 37 Democrats opposed uh, the package. It's probably not quite as resounding as some of the critics of that aid had hoped to muster. Also important to point out, 21 Republicans joined them in opposing that. So there was actually a relative bipartisan opposition to aid for Israel. But there's no question that the Democratic Party is uh, confronting a reckoning on uh, historic U.S. support for Israel, on the conditions that would be placed on the support and uh, certainly reinforced by the fact that as this debate is happening on the floor of the House, uh, campuses around the country, uh, not including this one so far, but uh, in other places are seeing uh, just really difficult student protests uh, and really challenging questions about how to respond to that. All right. And so before we dive into the the actual politics on the floor of the House, um, uh, Jessica, there was one other ally that was in on all this. Um, where does Taiwan and China, um, the great 
power competition mm-hmm. um, fit in all this and then throw in the debate over TikTok while we're at it, which also made it as part of the, uh, the foreign aid debate. Yeah, so I think it's just this growing concern over China and um, it's growing economic power, but then also privacy concerns and things. And that's sort of where TikTok comes into this, which is, of course, a very popular app with the younger generation, but, you know, is bankrolled by a Chinese company. And so there are privacy concerns there. I think that, you know, what are they spying on? How are they getting into things and stuff? So I think that's where a lot of that came in. But you do see, you know, we're especially seeing this playing in Republican primaries. Um, Again, to the issue of immigration and all of this too, but also, you know, who will stand up and be forceful against China and and different things is is something that's definitely playing. And, you know, as I'm watching some of these Senate primaries, um, and different things as well. So that's something that we are seeing in the Republican Party that you see Trump talking about, um, and Democrats as well. So I mean, this that that is they, that was probably the least controversial one. The TikTok part aside, really, that I think you had the Ukraine issue, and then especially Israel and Hamas being the most hot button issue. Um, and I would just underscore too. I think you know this is the Israel Hamas issue, um, and it and Israel aid can. I, I expect it to have a big impact in the presidential election and, you know, at a micro level on the states, for instance, I'm watching Michigan, particularly a really critical swing state that has a large Arab American population. We saw um, a protest, a sizable protest vote there against Biden in the primary that was really a pro forma primary. Um, but how will that swing state go and how will, you know, these, these states with has the largest um, Arab American population in the U.S.? And um, um, Minnie, before we go to our break, um, uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say you're the youngest uh, participant on this show. Um, uh, 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 Banning TikTok, um, aid to Israel, supporting Ukraine. um, Which one of these motivates um, uh, people under, oh, let's say 40 more than anything else? You know, I think we'll have to see. I think this is a very debated issue. I think, obviously, Biden has some problems with young voters. He needs to get, you know, a significant share of them to come out and vote for him. And I think there's a sense of just kind of apathy, and there has been for a long time, and a sort of sense that Biden is more of the same. I think when it comes to Israel, as um, Asher was talking about, you know, we've seen a lot of young people come out to college campuses protesting, Um, against, you know, the humanitarian crisis. And I think, you know, there is some humanitarian aid in this bill, but I'm not sure young people are following it that closely. I think they're just kind of getting a sense from this kind of legislation that this is, you know, more of the same. I think also with TikTok, you know, it's going to be a little while before we actually see consequences of the legislation in terms of like actually limiting people's access to the app. So again, I I don't know how much young voters, how much they have the time and energy to actually pay attention to the intricacies of the law. But I think depending on how the parties message it, like we've seen, um, you know, Trump kind of, you know, trying to pin that on Biden and, and that the TikTok stuff, if it is messaged correctly, I think could hurt. Um, Biden and Democrats among young people by kind of suggesting that he's trying to, or the government rather, is trying to kind of limit their speech, even though it has to do instead with these um, concerns with security. All right. When we come back after the break, we're going to take a deep dive into what actually happened on the floor of the House of Representatives um, and uh, the reaction um, in the Senate thereafter um, with our guests in just a moment. Our guests again today include Jessica Taylor. Jessica is the Senate and Governor's Editor for the Cook Political Report, covering both local and national politics. And she's the first woman senior author of the venerable Almanac of American Politics, a post she held in both the 2022 and the 2024 editions. Previously, she reported for Inside Elections and National Public Radio. Joining us for the first time is Asher Hildebrand. Asher is an associate professor of the practice at Duke University, an outstanding school, one of the finest in America, known for basketball and brain power in North Carolina. Prior to becoming a scholar at Duke, Asher worked in national and state politics in both Washington, D.C. and North Carolina. 
And with us is Minnie Racker. Minnie is a politics reporter at the Daily Beast. She was previously a staff writer at Time Magazine, where she covered the 2024 presidential primaries. And before that, covered politics for the National Journal and the Los Angeles Times. Her reporting spans the intersection of politics, culture, and identity. All right, Asher, let's start off with you here. Who is Mike Johnson? And how did he emerge as the champion of of uh, financial aid to these beleaguered American allies. Well, I'm sure uh, there's still a lot of people out there who don't know who it is, but I can guarantee that a year ago today, almost nobody would have been able to identify his name. He is a representative from Louisiana who emerged from uh, a long and uh, ugly and sort of humiliating saga that followed the ouster of the former Republican Speaker Kevin McCarthy uh, after several other candidates uh, were sort of uh, forced to uh, withdraw their candidacy from the race or didn't, couldn't muster the support uh, in an act of uh, exhaustion and also some uh, degree of uh, actual support, Johnson emerged as the new speaker. Uh, but this is really the first major test he has faced when it comes to the dynamic that led to his predecessor's downfall, which is that to pass a lot of things in the House of Representatives today, uh, he simply must rely on Democratic votes. That's because uh, the Republican majority in the House is very slim, even slimmer today than it was when he assumed the speakership. And it's also because there is a faction of the Republican conference that will oppose just about anything uh, that uh, that involves spending money and especially spending money in support of U.S. allies. And so uh, to overcome that dynamic, Johnson decided to split this legislation into four separate bills. Uh, he also added a few sweeteners to the package, like the TikTok ban for his Republican colleagues. And I think that was a creative strategy and a risky strategy and that Johnson deserves credit for taking the risk. But it's also worth noting it was a strategy that was probably available available to him months ago, uh, which raises the question of why he took him why it took him so long uh, to employ that strategy. Uh, and uh, I think there are a few answers to that question, but I'll stop there and let our other panelists in. All right. Well, thank you, Asher. So, so Jessica, let's take a closer look at what um, uh, what Mike Johnson did and at who voted for and against four different bills all in one big package. Um, uh, why did he have to divide it up? And, and in the end, what did we learn from, uh, from this experience? Well, as Asher said, I think, you know, this splitting it up is really what helped, but, you know, I think that we look back and of course this has been an issue for months and, you know, especially looking at the aid for Ukraine as, as, you know, Russia has continued its encroachment and, you know, they've, had a real need for weapons or facing defeat, really. Um, but I really think it took him a while to get his sea legs. You know, as he said that, uh, you know, this was new to him. He was sort of a backbencher. He had a small role in leadership. And I, I really think he became speaker because everyone else was exhausted and he didn't have sort of enemies in the way that, you know, other people were. And um, I, I think that, he, he faced, he, he, I think he learned some lessons from McCarthy in that he didn't want to upset the caucus, but I also think that he grew as a leader in realizing what is best for the United States and our allies. And, you know, I think uh, one, one piece I was reading this week noted that, you know, things get different when you're getting the intelligence briefings and, and you learn more about these things. And so we have seen, you know, members of his caucus that oppose this and that, you know, some of the I call them the rabble rouser caucus that's helped oust McCarthy to begin with, uh, led by Marjorie Taylor Greene, very in a very infamous member, trying to bring back up the um, you know the trying to remove him as speaker to vacate the chair. But I think the difference is that 
we clearly saw that on these bills that a majority of the Congress approved it. But then, of course, there is, you know, the what is typically done in the Republican conference is that unless a majority of the conference supports this, they don't bring it to the floor. But again, we saw he has such a small margin. It's one seat right now. When we have special elections in a few months, it'll grow to three seats. But he's had to get Democratic support for this. Um, and that's the only way that these things were able to pass. And, you know, the real question I think going forward is I, I think it's doubtful that they sort of oust him over this in the same way that McCarthy is because I think he's engendered more goodwill across the aisle and that they saw that he was willing to sort of buck his caucus and the hardliners in the caucus and bring this forward um, and I think they trust him and maybe not trust but like they're less wary of him in a way that Kevin McCarthy was who Kevin McCarthy was such a political animal and you know at the same time when Democrats had bailed him out on spending bills he went on TV and trashed Democrats and I think that really contributed to his out last year but so i think that johnson they kind of see as a more fair bargainer and arbitrator and you know it's he's really grown into the speakership i think you know is he the most experienced speaker that we've ever had absolutely not um but you know he was able to do this and um will he face repercussions we will see but i i am kind of doubtful that he he will because again it was this would have to be democrats agreeing to oust him too and even though you know i think they benefit from some of the chaos we see on the republican side as we look toward the battle for the house in the fall um they also realize that they need something functional and that you know well, could they get someone uh, worse in a way i mean uh Mini, is, is, there, is there a really hopeful sign here? Do we now have a bipartisan working majority to get things done in the House of Representatives? Are things back in business? <laughs> well, I won't give you. I'm honestly, you know, I, I think Johnson has done something impressive here in kind of threading the needle. I think especially that he's kind of been able to engender, um, you know, some goodwill among Democrats while... Um, it seems like he's keeping Trump on his side. I think that the main thing that held up this kind of aid was um, Trump's opposition earlier this year um, to seeing legislation move. And over time, Johnson has kind of won Trump over. And we didn't see Trump come out hard against this bill. We saw him, you know, expressing some minor doubts, but not going after Johnson at all. In fact, standing with Johnson, saying, you know, he has a hard job, kind of tacitly expressing his support. So I think, you know, Johnson has really pulled something off here if he's able to, you know, not get Trump mad at him and also have Democrats on his side. That said, you know, I think it's funny that we see, you know, so many people in media and in government and in Washington praising bipartisanship, saying that that's the aim. But when it actually happens, there is a huge amount of pushback um, for, you know, working with the other side. Um, I think, you know, Johnson is about to face some sort of um, consequences from his party. I, I don't think I agree with Jessica that I do think Democrats are going to save him. But I think there's still, you know, a significant share of lawmakers in D.C. and voters out in the country who react badly to this kind of bipartisanship. They think it's, you know, um, backroom deal making. They think it's um, not not really something they want to see. And I think as we approach the election and attacks kind of get uglier against the other side, there's not going to be a lot more opportunities for this kind of work. So it, it needed to get done now, basically. Uh, important to point out that nearly all of the Republican hardliners opposed aid to Ukraine, but there's also a si significant number, uh, dozens of Republicans who are generally not considered hardliners who also supposed uh, who also uh, opposed it um, something like uh, 112 republicans overall a majority of the conference so that dynamic is not going away we can't take it off the table all right thank you very much jessica taylor mini racker and asher hildebrand for helping to explain the uh, process of making foreign aid get through congress um, to our viewers abroad thank you for joining us on dachel washington Wasalna il Khatam Hadhil Halkam in Baranamaj Dakal Washington. In Kenneth the Dekum, Asala O Istaf Sarat, Wa Khasatan Haul El Siasa El Dakalia, Lil Daam El Khadji, Arju El Tawasul Mai, Abur Twitter, Allah hashtag inside Washington, O Marasalti Mubasharatan at Rob Satloff.
נלתקי פיאלוס בורל מוקביל, ואחת הדלק ההן שוקרן לקום, ואילה לקה.